Hi, I'm G, and in this video I'm adding a second layer of colour to my expressive watercolour of cherry tomatoes. So in my previous video I laid down my first layers of colour. No penciling out, just paint straight onto the paper, and if you missed that first video showing how I did those early layers, then there's a link for that below. So I've downsized my brush size in this video. I've gone down from a size 8 to a size 6 to paint the cherry tomatoes this time around. And you can see me beginning with the palette on the right hand side using some cadmium scarlet again. And I'm putting it on the palette and I'm watering it down less than I did the first time. First time you saw me use a lot of water to get those really pale colors that you can see on the paper right now. But now as you see me adding the slightly less watered down, slightly less diluted cadmium scarlet, you can see it's a much brighter red. It's a lovely red with a, you know, a quite a strong hint of orange going on there. So it's absolutely perfect for the cherry tomatoes. So you can see me just filling that in now, adding a little bit of water to it, making it a little bit lighter as I go, but mostly just lying on that nice paint straight from the palette there. And then I need to darken some areas. So I decided to use a nice rich brown for this and that's burnt sienna. So what I'm doing whilst the cadmium scarlet is still wet is I'm going in and I'm just spotting, just dropping in little bits of burnt sienna and letting that burnt sienna kind of like flood outwards, you know, run where it wants to with, with the paint. Of course, it'll only go, it'll only run about where I've already got wet paint. It won't really go anywhere else. And that's one of the great things about watercolor. You know, if the space on your paper is wet, then you can drop loads of colors on top of it and they'll blend and they'll mix and they'll move around, but they won't flood outwards. Uh, that's a you know, brilliant thing about watercolors and watercolor paper. With thinner regular papers, you would find that all of that moisture, all of that kind of wet paint would soak into the paper, would bleed into the paper and would run around and start getting all fuzzy edged and stuff. But watercolor being nice and thick and usually it's size, which sometimes means it's a funny coating on the surface of it. It kind of stops that from happening. So like I said, the paint will only go where you have already kind of wet it or put down wet paint. So here you can see me continuing with this uh, tomato, working downwards now into an area which is going to have a lot more shadow. So yes, I'm putting on a lot of cadmium uh, scarlet, but I'm also going to be adding quite a lot of uh, burnt sienna into this to make it darker. So you might be looking at this and thinking, oh, those tomatoes look really good. They're all watery and expressive. Anyway, what are you going on here and adding all of this, you know, dark and more saturated color? Well, because when I looked at the reference photo, it did have really bright reds and kind of brown colors to it. And that's what attracted me to it in the first place. So I thought that I really wanted to include those kind of saturated colors. Now here you can see me adding Payne's Gray because I've realized that the burnt sienna is just not going to make those shadows as dark as I want them to be. So what can I add to make those shadows even deeper, even darker? So I go in with Payne's Gray. Might not be the immediate choice that you would go with, but in the reference photo, these, these tomatoes have been kind of cooked or maybe, uh, you know, grilled or something. So there are slightly kind of burnt looking patches on them. Uh, so I thought, you know, Payne's Grey. I've used it in the background already. So if I use it as a shadow on the actual tomatoes themselves, it provides a kind of color link between the background, the table that they're sitting on, and the actual dark shadow areas on the tomatoes. So that's another reason for me using the Payne's Grey as my kind of main shadow color here, because it provides that color link to colors I've already used in the background. And speaking of colors, normally when I'm doing a painting like this, I would have done a color test first of all. So I've got a little bit of paper on and I would have um, tested the colors on there to see which colors look the best uh, to do the tomatoes and also to do the background and to do the stalks. I didn't do that at all with this one because I am trying to do this expressive painting that for me is trying to be a bit less fussy. So I thought that that was one of the ways I kind of get a bit slowed down and a bit fussy sometimes doing quite meticulous <laughs> color test so make sure those colors are just right so I thought no I'm not going to do that this time I'm just going to have a look at my palette and sort of have a look at the colors that I think are going to work and I'm going to jump in with those um, so you know you might be looking at it thinking oh, it's not yeah you know but that was one of the things I wanted to do with this was be a little bit less fussy and just get into this painting, you know, using the colors that I thought were going to work rather than really, really trying to absolutely make sure and guarantee that the colors uh, were going to work. So here you can also see me, uh, I'm leaving white bits that I left the first time around. So those are going to be really nice, clean, bright paper white highlights on the um, cherry tomatoes. What I'm also trying to do is leave some um, areas of the first layer showing, as you can see me dropping in some more Payne's Gray and some more 
burnt sienna. I am trying to do that. I don't think perhaps I do that enough. What I really should be doing is spending a bit more time to make sure some of that first layer shows through a little bit more. Now for this section that you can see me working on right now, this is a bit where it's the inside of the tomato. The skin has split during the cooking and you can see all of these kind of cellular kind of shapes inside, little veins and little ridges and troughs because it's the inside texture of the tomato. So I'm trying to use the very, very tip of the brush here to do these kind of little kind of lines that are kind of growing upwards and in towards the center where the stalk is. And then once I've got those little kind of lines in there, I'm, again, while it's still wet, dropping in a little bit of burnt sienna and maybe a teeny little bit of uh, paint gray as well, just to give some slightly darker bits in there as well. Now, as I finish up doing this very first tomato, so the first one, almost my tester of a tomato, like how's it going to work, how the color's going to work, there's a few things that I want to kind of adapt and I want to change. So as I start this second one and I go in a little bit closer, you can see, first of all, I'm just filling those areas that are really nice and easy to do because they're kind of like uh, bordered off by the stalk or by the edge or whatever. So those are nice and easy, you know, bits to do straight away. So I get those out of the way and then I've got to work on the big section where I'm going to have to work quickly. And one of the things that I want to do with this section is I want to try to add a bit more water at sort of stages and little areas so that it will dilute some of that color and make some of that color run around. So I'm going to get more variety in the actual tomato skin and it's going to look a little bit more dark to light. I don't think maybe I've managed to achieve that so well on the very first cherry tomato. So that's my main aim on this one. So as I go in here with cadmium scarlet, it's really quite bright. It's really quite saturated. Next, I put my brush in the water come back in, so this is kind of a watery brush with some paint on it, now teasing that pure color upwards through the middle towards the sort of center. And you can already see it's really dark along the edges, but that water is making it really, really pale and more dilute through the middle bit. And then I add a bit more sort of a, the more saturated color right around the stalk. So already what I'm trying to do is give it a little bit more variation uh, in terms of the paint. So the paint doesn't just look like one flat color. It's actually got sort of lighter areas and darker areas as I'm putting on this second layer. So as I've started this one, I'm pleased with those colors and I'm pleased with that variation. It looks terrific. Time to add a bit of shadow. So here I go again with the burnt sienna, just spotting it in little patches that can run around and it needs to be a bit darker. So it's time to get a bit of Payne's Gray in there as well. So I just dribble a bit of Payne's Gray along the edge. Not too much, but I do want a bit of shadow where those two tomatoes are squished up against each other and they meet. Then I've got to start finishing off the rest of it. So you've seen that I've left that bit and there's a really pale bit right in the center of this tomato. And you're like, what are you doing? You're going to get a major drying line there. Yes, but that's okay because that's another area where the skin has split. So I'm going to have to handle that bit a bit differently. So this area you can see me working on right now. This was an area where I wanted to get... Uh, more of the first layer showing through, but I think I just overdid it and I oversaturated it. I had all that red on my brush. So I go and get a bit of water on there now and try and drop that in to hopefully try and dilute some of this, um, you know, really saturated red out. And it doesn't really work. I try it again, drop in a bit more water here, you know, because I'm trying to get this bit to be paler and a bit lighter so that the white highlights will not be so stark. There'll be some kind of like mid-tones, if you will, of red around the white, but it doesn't quite work. But more on that in a second. This bit is again like the first tomato, it's where it's split and you can see the textured inside of the tomato. So that's what you can see me doing with the very tip of the brush, just lots of little feathered little lines. And I try and solve that other problem by blotting it with a bit of tissue paper, just blotting that area that I felt was a bit too saturated. So that kind of works, it's kind of a compromise. For this little bit, you can see I had quite a large bright white highlight, but I decided to just put a little bit of kind of mid-tone color on that just to try and take that white highlight down a notch. Now in this one, what I've done is swapped over. So I've pushed the palette to one side, still got the painting in the shot, but now you can see the reference photo. And I've done this because you really, I think, need to see my motivation for, you know, really putting these saturated colors on here. When I'm looking at that reference photo, those lovely orangey reds, brown, scorched, kind of grilled highlight uh, marks and shadows on there, they look terrific, you know, and also you can see how strong the white highlights are on the picture too. So I've popped it in there so you can do a little comparison here as I'm painting and you can see, all oh, right, okay, that's why he's done that and that's where he's putting the shadows and so on. So you, you can really compare one to the other. What I really like doing is looking at myself and seeing the comparison between not just the photo and the painting, but my initial washes that you can see on the tomatoes on the right-hand side and then 
the saturated second layer of color that you can see on the left hand side. And when I look at it, I love the kind of expressive wateriness of the ones on the right, but I love the color and that really saturated jump off the page color that I'm getting on the ones on the left hand side. So I'm glad that I've done this. It is still perhaps, yeah, more expressive on the right hand side and perhaps getting less so on this left hand side. I don't know. I'm really trying, as you can see me painting it, keep it watery, keep it flowing, keep it loose, keep it fluid. Uh, but I still can't help but feel as though it's getting a little bit tighter on these ones on the left hand side. But what it has done is made me think about my approach to the painting. And uh, on the right hand side, when I did my first wash, what I did to add some darker patches was just introduce a bit more you know, raw color of cadmium scarlet. And that's what gave me the darker areas. But now I'm thinking what I could have done is made sure that the burnt sienna and the Payne's Grey were dampened up as well. So I could easily lift little bits of that color off the pans and drop that in as well as part of the first layer. So I could have got some much darker kind of areas on those tomatoes, and much brighter areas on those tomatoes in my first pass of colors. And maybe, maybe then I might have got it to the point where I didn't need to do a second layer. And that's what's so good about doing this kind of first expressive painting. Uh, you know, this is where I'm learning everything. This is where I'm learning perhaps what works and what doesn't, what I should have done maybe, uh, and what I didn't need to do. Uh, and that's kind of helping me not be too fussy about it as well, which I think is also helping it be, uh, you know, a much more expressive kind of painting. Uh, because I'm just learning all these things as I go and I'm letting go a lot of the control that I would normally have. So as I move on to painting the fourth cherry tomato here, you might be thinking, why is he painting it anti-clockwise? Uh, and the basic reason for that is I'm right-handed. So I've got to start on the left and work my way over towards the right-hand side um, so I don't smudge and, and smear all of the work. Um, I'm not quite sure why I didn't just go, you know, two top ones, two middle ones, two bottom ones. I just decided to do it this way. And it's just one of those little quirks, things that you decide to do when you're painting. And it's working. And you know, I'm working sort of downwards and then upwards, and I'll finish that one on the top right last. Um, <laughs> don't ask me why, just an artistic decision. Uh, so on this one, this fourth cherry tomato, again, I'm following a lot of the similar things that I've done before. I am trying to introduce more water into the color so that I've got that variation between really saturated cadmium scarlet and much paler areas of cadmium scarlet. I'm trying to leave some of the, um, the initial layer showing not just the bright white highlights. I'm still not being quite as uh, successful with it as I'd like to, <laughs> as I introduce a bit of burnt sienna here for a bit of shadow on this uh, right-hand side. But, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, you're probably looking at the reference photo on the left and going, oh, he's just put in a couple of little bits of, you know, extra white highlights there that aren't there on the original. Or, you know, I might have missed a few where there are some. And I think that's just you know, artistic decisions. Again, as you're going through it, I'm having to work quickly on this so that uh, I don't get drying lines and, and stuff doesn't dry too quickly. And that inevitably means that I'm going to maybe shortcut a little bit here and there, or maybe um, put in something that's maybe not technically there on the photo, or maybe leave something out that is there on the photo. Uh, and I think that's, again, just one of those things that when you're working very, very quickly, you do tend to make little sacrifices like that. Now at this stage I've realized that it's perhaps a bit too pale next to where I've just put in the, the kind of textured area of tomato. So I have to work outwards, downwards, and then upwards the side, but you can see me doing right here, whilst it's still damp. It's not fully wet, but it's still a bit damp to try and save that bit. Now here I am working on the smaller cherry tomato, one all on its own near the bottom. And I put in a bit of cadmium scarlet and then I lighten that edge with a bit of just pure water straight away. Then I put in some more card cadmium scarlet and I work it back up so it's almost touching the bit I've just painted, but it's not. I leave a tiny little sliver of dry paper in between this really rich red and the bit that I've just tried to lighten by dropping a droplet in uh, of clear water. And that's because I want that section to be pale like that. If you look at the photograph, you can see there's kind of a bit of a, a, a dent or a smunch in that top left-hand side of the cherry tomato. So that's what I'm trying to achieve. If I didn't leave that little tiny sliver of dried paper there and I push the, the dark red right up to the very edge of the bit where I've uh, just dropped in some clean water and lightened it up, then the two would flood together and the effect would be completely lost. So that's why I've left that little tiny sliver. 
Uh, down here at the bottom, you can see me putting a lot of rich color. Again, looking at the reference photo, really rich color, quite contrasty. It's rich color, and then you've got these very bright white highlights. Some of those highlights, maybe not bright white, maybe what I should have done when I was first doing this is left fewer white highlights. Uh, and then when I was doing this second stage of painting, maybe leave some of the sort of pinkish um, first layer showing through. So I'd get two different types of highlights then. I'd have bright white highlights, but I'd also have sort of pale uh, paint highlights as well in between the darker, you know, more saturated reds. So that's again something in my brain I've got to try and log and try and remember for the next kind of expressive painting that I do. Now this tomato out on its own, as you can see by the photo, has not got a massive amount of those really dark burnt kind of shadows that some of the tomatoes I've already painted have. So I try and lay off the Payne's Grey here as much as possible and just rely on using my Cambium Scarlet and also the Burnt Sienna to add some slightly darker, reddy brown shadows to this right hand side. The right hand side which is against the slightly more grey shadow on the tabletop that you can see. And all I do is just drop in lots of this Burnt Sienna once it's still wet. I love that effect of just dropping in that paint and without trying to control it too much, I've just dropped it in and now it can run where it wants to do. It can flood outwards and, and look like a really nice gradual change of shadow, you know, from dark to light on this side. That's one of the beautiful, you know, brilliant things about watercolor is that just dropping the paint in and letting it flow where it wants to go. Uh, it's so much fun and also it's actually really easy to do as well. You can just kind of plop it in and then just watch it. And, and the, the difficult thing, at least for me, is to not want to get my brush tip in there and try and control exactly where all of that color is going to go. You know, that's the tough bit. Really, it should be dead easy to just drop it in and let it run. Now these sections that I'm adding in now do look a, t a teeny bit darker, so I'm thinking this is probably slightly diluted Payne's Grey. Certainly not Payne's Grey straight from the pan, that would be too strong, too dark. So this looks as though maybe I've added a little bit of Burnt Sienna and Payne's Grey together to get those shadows. So here we go, we're sort of moving into the home stretch now. I've got, you know, most of the tomatoes done, I've got two more to do. Uh, but one of the things that you might have thought looking at the previous um, reference photo and now looking at the, the tomatoes is, well, the shadows on the table now maybe don't look dark enough for how bright and how dark and saturated your cherry tomatoes are looking. And that is a fair point. And that's something that as I was painting it, you know, I noticed and it wasn't lost on me. So I've got it in my head that once I finish the tomatoes, what I'm going to do is start adding some slightly darker shadows onto the table um, you know, using Payne's Grey and maybe a little bit of Cadmium Scarlet, but that's going to come, you know, way later. Now, it was suggested that perhaps I should have used exactly the same brush to do this second layer of colours. Um, you know, I'm using a size 6, and I said at the start of this video that it's a little bit smaller than the size 8 that I decided to do my initial first washes with. And I actually did think when I was thinking about that, that I had done the whole thing with the size 8. And it's only when I was looking back at the footage I realised that no, I didn't. I'd gone a little bit tight, I'd moved down a brush to a, a, a smaller brush that I could get a bit more noodly with and a bit more detail with. And I'm thinking it would have been trickier, definitely with the size eight, to fill in the areas around the stalk, like what you can see me doing right now. That would have been a lot trickier with the size eight. It does have a kind of finish point on the end of it, but no way near what I'm able to get out of this size six. So that's one of the things, but what I would have liked about it is obviously the bigger brushes hold more paint, hold more moisture and water. So what I could have done is got that effect that I've been trying, you know, for most of the cherry tomatoes so far with, that effect of it varying from a really saturated to a, then a very diluted area of color. I could have got that way more using the bigger brush because of course I could get more water on it and more watery paint on it in the first place. In fact it's kind of difficult not to because it's such a big brush with all those bristles that will just catch and hold the paint. So using a bigger brush probably would have given me a bit more variation in the dark and light areas on the cherry tomatoes and again that is something else that I've got to think right okay make a mental note of and when I'm painting stuff in future maybe don't downsize my brushes you know, at least perhaps do a picture where I keep everything done with that big brush and see how it works, see how it comes together. Does it work or is it too clumsy and too clunky and stuff ends up being uh, just swamped by water, which was a kind of like touch and go <laughs> in the very first video when I did the first watch washes. I was kind of a bit worried I was swamping the thing with water. 
but you know maybe I should just go out there and try it and experiment and see how that you know works in a video. As you're watching these last two tomatoes get painted, you might be seeing that I'm being quite bold and quite brave with the use of Payne's Grey and, and not being too shy about whacking in quite a big amount of it. Well, first of all, those tomatoes are on the right-hand side and it's the shadowed side of them as well. So I can be a bit bolder and a bit braver with um, the, the shadow colors there. And you might be thinking, well, why Payne's Grey? You know, why not use a, you know ivory black or something like that uh, or a darker brown? Uh, well, first up, I don't have a darker brown. Um, I only had sort of burnt sienna, it was the darkest one that I had. Uh, and second of all, I don't really like using black to make a color um, darker. I find it dulls the color. And what I wanted to do was try and keep the colors as bold and bright and as strong uh, for this as they appeared in the reference photo. I mean, you know, you saw it, those reds are beautiful and saturated and really bright. So that was another reason to not just go all out with the black. And I gotta admit, Payne's Gray is one of my favorite colors. It's probably in all of my palettes. I mean, I've got about three watercolor palettes of varying sort of quality and Payne's Grey is in every single one of them. And if it's not, I go out and buy some because I just find that Payne's Grey is a terrific color for perhaps making things a bit darker because it's not a dull black. It's got that blue kind of tinge, that blue edge when you, know, you can see in the background there, that kind of bluey gray kind of color. Uh, and that is, I find it really versatile and I end up using it a lot in colors to make colors darker or to just put something kind of a bit bluish in the background. So, you know, that's probably another reason why I like using the Payne's Gray here. Payne's Gray is a bit of a, it's a comfort color for me, if you will. It's one of those colors that, yeah, I just always have in a palette and it is a tremendous color to use to make things darker. And slightly random fact, I actually got into Payne's Grey through seeing an exhibition by an artist, an exhibition of artist's work, um, a British artist, terminated artist called George Shaw, who'd done a whole series of paintings, just painted in Payne's Grey, big watercolours of old sort of drab housing estates. Uh, I think, uh, I can't remember where he was living, but I saw the paintings in Newcastle. Uh, at the Baltic Gallery, and I just absolutely loved them. They were really big scale, all in these kind of bluey Payne's Grey, nothing else. And I just thought that is a fantastic color. You know, I got to go out and buy some of that. So my kind of influence of using Payne's Grey on my own pictures has been kind of um, caused by seeing the work of an artist in an exhibition. And I suppose it's another thing that I'm going to try and make a point of here. Seeing artists work, if you can, going to galleries and seeing their work, it's a tremendous way of picking up ideas of, you know, just palette, not even just skills. So there you go, pretty much finished. Let me know in the comments below what you think of it, how you think my adventure of expressive watercolor painting is getting on. The goods, the bads, the uglies. And don't forget to please subscribe so you don't miss more and also like them. And in my third and final part of these videos next time, I will be showing you how I darken the stalks and also darken some of the shadows in the background and maybe even added some splatters. Thanks for watching.